I'm Dr. Sabrina Siegel with the Neuroscience Education Institute. Welcome to the NEI Podcast. On this show, I sit down with renowned mental health care experts from a range of diverse backgrounds to discuss breakthroughs and best practices for treating patients with mental health conditions. In this episode of the NEI podcast, we are taking a look back at Dr. Roger McIntyre's presentation from the 2022 NEI Synapse titled Bipolar Disorder Rainbow, the Spectrum of Treatments for Depression and Mania. Let's listen in as Dr. McIntyre shares with us the most current research on treatments for bipolar disorder. Bipolar disorder is so complicated phenomenologically and diagnostically. And then to add more complexity, the treatments are very different. I don't just mean safety and tolerability, but on the efficacy profile. And I remember when I started, patients with bipolar would go on a mood stabilizer. The words mood stabilizer means nothing anymore. It just, it used to mean lithium and valparate and carbamazepine, but that's not what it even means anymore. So we kind of get rid of that language. And now we talk about the different treatments and what effects they have across the different phases of the illness. So what I'll do, just focus on bipolar depression. That's the enemy of the state. That's the most common presentation. That's the most common presentation in clinics. We have very few options. And when you start to filter the medicines as a function of weight gain, liability, and diabetes, we have even fewer. So for example, we have cariprazine, lorazodone, and lumetepirone because protiapin, olanzapine, fluoxetine, these agents have significant weight gain and metabolic disruption. I want to highlight lamotrigine. Lamotrigine is not FDA approved for bipolar depression, but it's not uncommon to adjunctively administer it in people who have bipolar depression acutely. Antidepressants, not recommended or not FDA approved, I'm sorry, not FDA approved, but we're going to see very quickly here that they are very often prescribed. So in bipolar disorder, the modal number of medications people are prescribed is between three and six. So polypharmacy is the rule, not the exception in this population, albeit polypharmacy is much more common later in the illness course than earlier. Makes us wonder whether if we can get them diagnosed and treated in a way that's more appropriate, that might decrease the likelihood of having such complex polypharmacy regimens. One of the questions I'm looking at right now in, a, uh, in an analysis is whether or not some of the newer atypical antipsychotics approved in bipolar depression, because they have a broader spectrum of effect, can that decrease the need for so much medications being co-prescribed? I don't think anyone would take offense to reducing the number of medications. Lorazodone shown to be effective in bipolar depression. This has been with us now for the better part of a decade, monotherapy and adjunct. Because of the medication's engagement of certain receptors like the 5-HT7, like Trintellix 40 oxetine, there's been this lingering hypothesis, can this medication improve cognition? And that's one that we're still cogitating. We still don't know yet if that's indeed the case, but we have a reason to believe it could be. Some recent data showing that lorazodone could improve anhedonia in people with bipolar depression, which again, as I said, is a very common and very debilitating part of depression. And it's been shown to treat those four A's. In other words, the mixed features presentation, both in the bipolar population and in people with MDD. That is people with major depressive disorder who don't have bipolar disorder, about 25% of them have mixed features. Lorazodone's been shown to be effective in treating that not uncommon presentation of major depressive disorder. Now, recently we've had cariprazine, since about 2018, was approved in bipolar disorder. And this is an agent that's approved in mania, mixed, and depression. So you have lorazodone in bipolar depression, type 1. Cariprazine's approved in mania, mixed, and bipolar depression, type 1. And this is a drug that really preferentially engages the D3 receptor very quickly. The D3 receptor is located in the cognition control and the reward center of the brain. That gives you a little hint as to what it might be doing. And there are evidence to show that animals who take cariprazine are less anhedonic. They're a little smarter. And when you, in fact, run these analyses, what you're finding now in people with schizophrenia and bipolar disorder 
There are some hints of improvement now in their cognition. I'd love to see a study with cariprazine in bipolar disorder with comorbid alcohol in drug abuse, given the role of D3 in modulating alcohol and drug misuse. There are some data to show that D3 modulation could reduce that, and we look forward to seeing if that study is done. This is data in bipolar depression type 1 with and without mixed features. And cariprazine, perhaps because of that effect on D3, is alleviating not just anhedonia, but also improving some of these cognitive elements that we think are so critical to mixed. And these patients who present with such hostility and agitation and irritability are exhibiting an improvement. And this is also seen in some of the hostility outcomes in schizophrenia, where this medication is also been approved. Now, the FDA currently is reviewing cariprazine for potential augmentation of its label to now include major depression. The data have been submitted. We have data also in major depressive disorder, just like aripiprazole, brexpiprazole, wherein cariprazine has now been shown to be antidepressant when added to conventional antidepressants. So during COVID, we were giving psychiatric medications to treat COVID. You probably all have heard that fluvoxamine is being used to treat acute COVID infection. We have a study underway where we're uh, placebo control trial giving vortioxetine, Trintelex, to try and treat long COVID syndrome, a very different phenomenon we'll talk about this afternoon. Well, this is the reversal. This is actually a drug that was once an anti-bug drug. This is lamotrigine. It was derived from a drug called pyrimethamine, which is an anti-malarial drug. And this anti-malarial drug became lamotrigine, became an antidepressant, but it's a recurrence prevention drug. Its benefit clearly is observed. It has an FDA approval for the prevention of depression, but not for acute depression. And it is a very, very good antidepressant, especially when it's added to lithium or some of the newer atypical antipsychotics. Lumateperone is a newer kid on the block, and this drug is approved in bipolar 1 and bipolar 2. So remember that one of those ARS questions about bipolar 1, bipolar 2? So lumateperone and quetiapine are the only two drugs that have been FDA approved in bipolar 1 and bipolar 2. And this agent was studied in both monotherapy and as adjunct to lithium and valparate. And the point about this medication is its blockade of dopamine is considerably lower than we're used to. And because of that, it is thought that there's less likely to see EPS. You're less likely to see prolactin elevation and less likely to see that kind of uh, drug effect that many patients with high D2 blocking agents will complain of. We've been able to show that this agent, yes, treats depression, BP1, BP2 alone or as an adjunct but also helps patients with those very, very commonly encountered mixed features. Um, there's actually been an attempt now to look at this medicine with respect to its ability to improve anhedonia, but also can this medication improve cognition? So this is a nice dashboard, just provides a summary because we've had these five atypical agents that are FDA approved in the acute phase. So you can see lumateperone in monotherapy adjunct lithium to valparate, and you can see quetiapine also has BP2, but has the liability of weight gain. Uh, and then you have lorazodone in bipolar depression. And cariprazine also has mania and mix. That's an important point to emphasize with cariprazine. But coming back to lamotrigine, where it really seems to have a one plus one equals three effect is when it's added to something else. And lithium plus lamotrigine, I call that double L therapy, are in fact very, very, very uh, commonly prescribed in my office. So the heat map just speaks to weight, metabolic changes, and this is something we all know. You're all monitoring for this. And this obviously changes the calculus with respect to quetiapine insofar as it has these problems, and that has undermined uh, some of its acceptability with patients. And obviously, it's not the only adverse event category, but a major one in this particular group. And that segues into a relatively new approval Alanzapine samidorphin. This is the combination of an antipsychotic and an opioid antagonist. I'm always asked, what's the difference between samidorphin and naltrexone? It's very different, uh, pharmacodynamically, pharmacokinetically, and behaviorally, they have very different effects in animals. 
And this drug is effectively behaving as a mu delta kappa opioid receptor antagonist with a lot of mu antagonism. That's quite different than naltrexone. And the approval is not just in schizophrenia, but in bipolar one disorder, mania mixed in maintenance. And the approval <clears throat> was really granted grandfathering some of the older olanzapine studies. So Sammy Dorfin has been shown to be safe, shown to be uh, <clears throat> um, uh, uh, able to mitigate <clears throat> the weight gain of olanzapine. So representing, I think, uh, almost a, a re-opportunity for olanzapine, a drug that was very popular in bipolar one disorder for quite some time and understood, understandably, sort of went to the back bleachers a little bit because of the weight gain issue. So this is a new way to think about it. And it's a new opportunity for people who might be candidates for olanzapine. Antidepressants, they just don't really work that well. In bipolar one disorder, the switch risk is not very high. When you prescribe an antidepressant, the concern is not so much the switch. The concern is actually they just don't work. Switching can happen. Destabilization can certainly happen, but it doesn't happen very often. There's more they don't work. So one of the ARS questions was, what's the most frequently prescribed class of medications for people with bipolar disorder in America? The answer is antipsychotics. They're the most frequently prescribed. Lithium and valparate have really dropped off. Antidepressants come in number two. Now, I don't really mind valparate dropping off because it didn't really work that well for maintenance. It's not a very good antidepressant. It treats mania and it has a whole bunch of side effects as well as safety concerns and the risk, the teratogenic risks, not just anatomical teratogenicity, but also cognitive and behavioral teratogenicity is much higher than we thought. And <clears throat> maybe where you guys live, everyone plans pregnancies, but in Toronto, no one plans them. And so I always assume no one's planning the pregnancy. So Valparate, I don't mind it going into the, into the past. But lithium should be probably prescribed more than we're prescribing it. Here's, a, here's a, a study I want to share with you that really kind of changes our world a little bit insofar as antidepressant monotherapy and bipolar disorder. That sounds like something we should never do. But turns out the evidence supports the safety and the efficacy of antidepressant monotherapy in BP2 in some cases. And I would not do this in the case of rapid cycling or someone who has mixed features or someone who has a history of destabilizing on antidepressant, but the evidence does support this behavior in some cases. And that's something I wanted to leave with you because that's a bit of a area that's a bit misunderstood. The destabilization risk is higher in BP1 than it is in BP2. Right now, we still kind of anguish this issue because do no harm is the guiding principle always in medicine. And when we're reaching for any medicine for a person with bipolar, my goodness, you don't want to make life worse. But there are data supporting antidepressant monotherapy and BP2. And this is just a, a drop down menu of considerations, which are mostly common sense that you might consider when prescribing an antidepressant BP2. Do psychostimulants increase the risk of switch in bipolar disorder? No, not higher than placebo, they don't. And this was a study showing that when you prescribe a mood stabilizer, which is MS, which is an outdated moniker, the overall switch risk is no higher uh, in this group. If you're not giving them a mood stabilizer, the risk is elevated. So psychostimulants should be added to mood stabilizing agents like atypicals, lithium, lamotrigine. And when you do that, the risk is not higher. And you're being asked about this all the time because about one in five people with bipolar meet the criteria for ADHD and a higher percentage have cognitive complaints. In the remaining couple of minutes, I'll just say the following. We're looking at many new targets in this area, and I'm not going to get into all the details of this. Metabolic drugs that we just are looking at, whether insulin sensitization can improve bipolar depression outcomes anti-inflammatory drugs, the list goes on and on. Tomorrow, during my depression presentation, we're going to talk a lot about glutamate and, of course, ketamine. But the ketamine story is the first inning of the baseball game. There's many, many, many agents that are being looked at that can engage glutamate. And this is a really, really interesting and opportunistic story. We've been able to show that in bipolar depression, ketamine, racemic intravenous infusion is safe. And effective. And it's been shown, in fact, to not have a higher risk of mania, 
or psychosis or dissociation than their MDD, major depressive disorder, counterparts. We just embarked on a very large repeat dose study in bipolar depression to look at the safety and efficacy of this more with a real attention to suicidality, because that is an area we just haven't been able to do as well in our patients. This is some data showing a reduction, not just in depression, but a reduction in those malignant mixed features in people who have bipolar depression. You all know suvorexin, lamborexin. They're drugs that are so-called dual orexin receptor antagonists. These are drugs that have also been shown to have benefits on mood and cognition. And there's an interesting story unfolding now, sorry, uh, unfolding now that some of these drugs might be antidepressants. In fact, one of them, at least more than one actually, is being studied as an antidepressant, a drug called celtorexin. So in my bipolar patients, patients with bipolar disorder, I have gravitated more to the orexin antagonist to help with their omnipresent sleep problems because it helps. It reduces the arousal, which is a major problem, and also may have some additional benefits on these other areas. I've certainly seen it. I've kind of fallen a little out of love with N-acetylcysteine. This is an antioxidant. There's a good story why we give antioxidants in bipolar disorder, but the data have been underwhelming. This is the most recent meta-analysis Bit of a two thumbs down, frankly, didn't quite work. I think we need to understand who should get these treatments. In other words, we need to understand those predictors a bit better. ECT, underutilized, certainly the treatment that is of choice and the most resistant, the most malignant of depression. And it is as effective in bipolar depression as it is in major depression. There's some nice data coming out with the transcranial direct current showing this can be helpful for some patients with bipolar depression. TMS is not studied as much in bipolar depression as ECT, but we do have now compelling evidence. I would see it as being a treatment alternative now in bipolar depression. Lithium reduces suicide. Lithium has been shown to be a uh, agent that delays the onset of episodes. And a really tantalizing story that lithium might also reduce Alzheimer's disease, which is elevated in bipolarity. It's been known to reduce amyloid as well as hyperphosphorylated tau deposition in the brain. Cognition, what's the treatment for cognition and bipolarity? Prevention. Stop using so much weed, alcohol, get some sleep. Those ice cream cone sized joints have got to go, okay? Less alcohol. Less benzodiazepines. Lose some weight. Lose some weight. It's highly procognitive. Let's get the insulin resistance corrected. Those are all prevention strategies. Now, the, the poly pill nobody wants to swallow, of course, is exercise. Most people would prefer to swallow a porcupine than, than swallow exercise. And so that has been shown to be procognitive. But we're looking at a variety of treatments. Some of these atypicals I talked about. It's tantalizing to uh, think about the orexin antagonist as well. But we do have some data for cognitive remediation as helping cognition. This is not widely available, but maybe now with some of the technology and the online care we provide, this might be more ubiquitous and more available at point of care. I'm not going to go through the guidelines. I just wanted to bring to your attention the Florida Psychotherapeutic Guidelines, they are free of charge. They're downloaded online circa 2020, the most updated U.S. originated guidelines for bipolarity. We just adapted it here for level one treatment in bipolar depression, lorazidone or lumateparone alone or monotherapy uh, or adjunct to lithium valparate. And of course, we have quetiapine and lumateparone for bipolar two disorder. And I'm hoping these will be updated again in the next year or so, but they are the most updated guidelines. Download them from the Florida Psychotherapeutic Guidelines website. Thank you so much for joining us for another episode of the NEI podcast. Please let us know what you'd like to hear more about by leaving a review. Don't miss another episode. Subscribe today. Subscribe today.